Image family, good morning. Hey, listen, I want us to put our hands together and celebrate one more time Vacation Bible School this past week. Y'all, listen, it was absolutely incredible. We had kids here, our volunteers. We are blessed with some of the greatest volunteers in the country. And I just want to say thank you to all of you that served. My kids had an incredible time. Uh, my daughter came home to share another story, and she was like, Daddy, I want you to know, did you know that God's plan is better than our plan? And uh, it was just phenomenal to have conversations with her that came from um, three days of our people investing in and teaching her the Bible. And so, man, if you didn't get a chance to jump in or your kids get, didn't get a chance to jump in this year, um, look forward to, to next year. All right. Well, if you've got your Bibles, Galatians chapter 6 is where we're going to be. We are finishing up our series the book of Galatians this morning. And so for some of you, it is your first time through a complete book. We are glad that you journeyed with us. For others of you, this is status quo for you. And um, welcome to um, another book that we're walking through. But as you're turning there, um, there's a guy named James K.A. Smith that wrote a book called You Are What You Love. And one of the things that he talks about in the book is this idea, gives this example of how we walk through the mall and there's all these different competing things that we see, things that we fall in love with, things that we can get infatuated by, things that we want, um, things that I mean, we desire to have. And, and his premise in the book is that you are what you love. In other words, what you love is indicative of what you worship. And so the question he asks is, what are you worshiping? Because what you worship shape what you love. And what we're going to see this morning from Paul as he wraps up the back end is he's going to give us a whole lot here, a whole lot of nuggets. But in essence, it's tethered to this idea of what do you love? What do you love? He's hammered the gospel over and over and over again, and we'll do so again this morning. But he's showing us that as a result of the gospel, we are now free to love, and we get to experience the love of God, and we get to live out love toward God. And there's a beauty to that. And he's going to begin to shape out or continue to shape out what that, what that looks like. Remember, he's talked about last week the fruit of the Spirit. And he's talking about what this love produces in us. And he's going to continue to move down that path, showing us how this love is produced in us and through us. And so Galatians chapter 5, verse 25 is where we're going to pick up and work our way to the end. But Paul says this, coming out of the fruit that the Spirit produces, he says, If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So Paul kind of comes on the back end to a central idea that he's held up a lot, which is the spirit. Now remember, the, the spirit is essential for the Christian life. The spirit is what makes you a Christian. It's how you receive the work of Jesus, how it's injected or imputed into you. It, it's how you get a new heart. It's how you have access to changing, transforming power inside of us. It's what produces the Christ-like characteristics in us. And so Paul's premise is that we've been set free from the power of sin. We've been set free from being bound to the law. In other words, we're not compelled by the law anymore, but we're compelled by love. We've been freed from the power of sin, and we're able to walk in that love through the Spirit inside of us. How does that happen? When we fix our eyes on Jesus. And that's what we talked about last week, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And Paul began to unpack what this love at work in us looks like. And he talked about the fruit that's produced as we fix our eyes on Jesus. And Paul's goal is, and you see it in chapter 5, is he wants us as Christians to live a spirit-filled life where we're consistent with the things of Christ. He wants us to be saturated in the things of Christ. He wants us to walk consistently like Christ. And he's going to continue to flesh out what that looks like this morning by kind of walking through a series of things of how the work of Christ in us produces something through us. In other words, what he's going to show us is how the love of Christ to us should be the love of Christ through us. In verse 26, he, he warns against some things that could potentially happen. He says, after he says, walk in the spirit, be consistent with the things of Christ. He says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. His point is this, that when the love of Christ is not the center of our lives, we can't be in step with the Spirit. We're not going to be walking in the things of Christ. We're not going to be consistent with the gospel. And that leads to what he lays out here. He talks about a couple of different categories. Now, one of the things we can't miss is what Paul's showing us is that it is possible for us to live in a way that is not consistent with the Spirit. This is why constantly we've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. It's why Paul talks about this war between the flesh and the spirit. There's going, to be, there's going to be things in us that compete against or desire the things counter to Jesus. And so we've got to keep our eyes fixed on him. It's why Paul calls us to stand firm. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, when we're not standing firm in the gospel, it'll lead to conceit, provoking, and envy. This is what Paul's holding up. Real quick, let me talk about these words. I think they're really important for us to kind of get our heads around as we look at a consistent life 
that's in line with the things of Jesus. The word conceited, it literally means empty praise, that you're, you're proud, that you think too highly of yourself. You, you think that you have a right to be able to be praised. Um, when, when I was in college, um, I took to bowling, um, and, and it's a fun fact for me, but I, I loved to bowl, and uh, I got into bowling big time and, and, and really liked it. Like, I got my own shoes, and I got my own ball, and you know, we used to go and a bunch of college buddies of mine, we would, you know, put like $2 a game in and, you know, we got more people there. And so you're talking about winning some serious meal money when you're in college. You know what I mean? I'm not advocating for gambling. I'm just saying we're having a little bit of fun with the cash prize. All right. But we go and we bowl and man, uh, me and my buddy, we did teams and uh, we got good, like really good. And uh, we, we started just dominating. We just raking it in every day and just, you know, crushing it. And uh, we were kind of unbeatable. And then all of a sudden, it's like literally we lost everything. Like we, we couldn't bowl at all. Like it just, we couldn't win. And so uh, uh, guys that were our friends started rubbing it in our face and just were like, man, they're taking home and they're getting all the meal money and we're walking out empty-handed. And it was just this really frustrating situation that like we couldn't get it back, you know? And so we found ourselves in this moment, like fired up and conceited, like we're the best. And we'd walk in and we were throwing it in all their faces. And in no time, all of a sudden we turn around and it's like, we're, we're terrible. We're terrible, right? The reality is what, what happens for us so often, and this is what happened to me at bowling. It happens to us in everyday life. But when we look to our ability as a means of our identity, then we'll become conceited. When, when we look to our ability as a means of our identity, then we'll become conceited. And here's what we do. Instead of looking to Jesus and the love and affirmation that he gives us and rooting our identity in that, what we do is we try to manufacture it on our own. And we do that by trying to elevate ourselves. By looking at ourselves and being like, man, I mean, I'm doing pretty good. I've got this thing together. And then we start to compare ourselves to other people and the people around us. And we look at our efforts and we look at our ability to give us some sort of identity. And here's what we do. Then we provoke and challenge people. That word provoke, same as challenging. We start challenging people in order to make ourselves look better. How do we do that? Well, we start holding up our way is better than their way. This is how you should do it. And I'm the expert. And let me show you how to do it. And we we start kind of assuming that we've got it all together. And so we start challenging other people in their ways. Like, why do you do this? And we do this. And, And our heart is not constructive feedback. Our heart is, let me show you how good I am. And so what we do is we, we passively start showing people how to do things and, and inserting ourselves into conversations in a way of holding ourselves up. And so when we're conceited and we think we're better and highly to be praised, it also leads to envy. Because here's what we don't want. We don't want them doing a good job. Envy is when you don't like the success of other people. It means you're jealous of other people. So if your way is better than their way and you think you've got it all together, what you don't want is them to succeed. And so you start to envy them, and you start to look at them, and you're like, man, I don't like it. I'm not excited for them when they succeed. And you start to, start to challenge other people, even in their success, to try to make yourself look better. Y'all, listen, when we don't have our eyes fixed on Jesus, we're going to put our eyes on other people. And instead of seeing what Jesus offers us through his finished work, we start comparing ourselves to other people, and it's detrimental to relationships, particularly in the life of the church. And so Paul says, listen, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Walk in the things consistent with Jesus. Don't fall to some of these things. And what he's going to do now is he's going to reorient us after saying, hey, don't fall to these things. Don't take your eyes off Jesus and put it on other people and compare yourself. He's now going to show us how we should walk. He's going to reorient us back to the gospel and what gospel-centered community should actually look like. And that leads us into chapter 6, verse 1, where he says this, brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken or caught in any wrongdoing, that's a sin. You who are spiritual, you're, you who are Christians, restore such a person with a gentle spirit. Remember, gentleness is having a humble heart. This is part of the fruit that the Spirit produces in you. Watching out for yourselves so that you also aren't tempted. Paul says, listen, guys, let me remind you after coming off the warning, you're not rivals competing for a prize. You're brothers and sisters in the faith. And one of the things that we've got to remember, and Paul's addressed this in Galatians, he's talked about legalism, holding to a set of rules as a means of your standing before God. Legalism breeds rivalry. And this is one of the issues in the church in Galatia is that legalism is running prevalent. He's saying, listen, when you fall to legalism, when you start looking at rules, you start comparing yourself and you start having rivalries within the church. His point is that you're not rivals, but you're brothers and sisters and you should support each other. And one of the ways that, that they should live this out is by pursuing people who've fallen into sinful patterns. And he reminds them that, hey, listen, by the way, as you pursue people that have fallen into sinful patterns, make sure that you don't fall to the very things that you're confronting in their life. He's saying be watchful over yourself. Now, 
we've got to talk about this for just a second. Because if you're culturally aware at all, we live in a very non-call-out culture. I mean, it's like you, the minute you go to somebody and you're like, hey, can I talk to you about something? And they even so much think that you might be talking about something in their life. It's like DEFCON 3 and helicopters are flying in, right? Like, it's just World War 3 between you three. Like, it's just, here it is. Nobody likes it. We, don't, we, we live in a culture where it's not acceptable. We, we live in a only God can judge me kind of culture, which, by the way, is a scary place to live in. That's not what anybody in our culture wants at this point. But, but this is where we live. This is non-call out, only God can judge me. And so we're so quick to throw our hands up the minute somebody tries to confront us. And here's the root of that. The reason why we have such a hard time, the reason why we are in a non-call-out culture, and the reason why we like to dub it off on only God can judge me, some sort of abstract statement, is because at the core... We're conceited. We think too highly of ourselves. We think th- too highly of ourselves. We don't want to be confronted but because we, we view ourselves in a certain kind of way. And if you infringe on that, nah, man, don't come up against me like that. We don't want anything like that. And Paul's showing us that as Christians, we should actually be the opposite, that we should be open and ready for people to confront us. Why? Because, y'all, we all have blind spots. Every single one of us has blind spots. Listen, I drive a 2007 Chevy Silverado. It is the same truck that Jesus would drive if he came in this day and age, okay? It's got good tires on it that are ready for off-road, and it is four-wheel drive because you don't get a truck unless it's four-wheel drive because it's the purpose of the truck, okay? It's also a Chevrolet, which is the greatest make and model of any truck in history, okay? Definitively, and that is, you'll find that somewhere in the Word. It's just in the footnotes, okay? But I, but I drive that. Well, here's the deal. Because it's a 2007 um, I don't have a backup camera or, or like blind spot sensors, okay? I know all y'all new car people do, and that's the cool thing, and the government now has mandated that. But, you know, us old car folks, we, we don't have that kind of thing. Um, so I don't have any kind of like sensory deal when I go to get over or any kind of braking and certainly don't have a backup camera, though I can back a truck in a parking spot better than anybody because I was doing it out the womb. You know what I'm saying? That's what you do. You back your vehicle in, okay? That's Uncle Mike on the side, but that's how you should do that to help everybody else. But I don't have any sensors. I don't have any blind spot stuff. But you know what I do have? I got a wife. I got a wife that is a blind spot sensor. I mean, she can sniff these cars out. She's like, oh, oh, look out, watch out. Oh, I mean, it's like, you know, she knows there could be a car that could potentially be in the blind spot, and she's going to call it out. She's going to make sure that I know that that car is there. If I'm backing up, she's going to know. She's going to be the beep alert, right? Instead of going beep, 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 she's like, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, like it's a little bit more intense in the car. Um, But I can promise you those brakes get hit pretty quick because I got a wife that is my blind spot sensor. Y'all, the reality is, is that's what the church should be, a blind spot sensor for us. That's why the church exists. God never intended you to go through the Christian life alone. He didn't save you into isolation. He saved you into a community. And it's why it's important that we're in community together, that we're in life-on-life relationships together so that people can point out the blind spots in our life. And so the question you've got to ask yourself is, do you have a space where people can point out blind spots in your life? As a church, we have things called community groups. We've got DNA groups. We've got serve teams. Like We have so many places where you can form relationships with people that will know you and love you and want to walk with you through the trials and temptations and tribulations that you're facing. The question is, are you being intentional to take that next step? Because Paul's assuming that we should have the relational equity to be able to be confronted and that be okay. Now, let me say this on the flip side. When it comes to the confronting, I know this can be very uncomfortable, but it's also very necessary. But the method is very important in how we do that. It is both truth, yes, and love. And for so long, Christian culture's missed because we love the truth side. I mean, give them truth, punch them in the mouth. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's get them. And it's like, that, that's not loving. It's truth and love. Those things can be true at the exact same time. Dutch truth, I had to counter my DMX quote last week, but Dutch truth says this, if I am not gentle... It is because I think of myself in an unhealthy way. The only reason we deal with people in the wrong way is because of how we measure them against ourselves. How we restore people is just as important as the restoration itself. Correction loses its impact when it's condescending. That'll preach right there. 
That'll preach right there. That's exactly what Paul's getting at when he's talking about this idea of, of confronting one another. And then in verse 2, Paul's going to continue in what gospel-centered community looks like. He says, carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Carry one another's burden means entering into the lives of those who are struggling in sin and taking on that struggle with them and helping them walk through the consequences that have resulted from their sin struggle. Paul's continuing kind of some of this flow of thought here. This is how we carry one another's burdens is by getting in the mess with them. By saying, I'm willing to walk with you through the challenges that have come as a result of your sin. I'm willing to walk with you through the wrestle of your sin. I'm willing to take on this sin with you to pray for you and walk with you and hold you accountable. And Paul connects what he says to fulfilling the law of Christ. Now, we've got to understand this because there's been this kind of whole law thing. What exactly is he, is he talking about when he talks about the law of Christ? Well, he's driving home the reality that we're no longer bound by the Old Testament law that was given through Moses. Remember, this is what the false teachers were holding up. It was, you know, the law plus Jesus equals salvation. So your works and you doing the right things and checking the right boxes plus Jesus equals salvation. But what we know to be true is that Jesus came as the fulfillment of the law to free us from the law, meaning that the law no longer defines us, the law no, no longer defines how we live, and the law no longer shapes us. Jesus does. This is what it means to be under the law of Christ is that he is the one that shapes us and shows us how we're to live. Paul summarizes it for us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, when he says, the entire law is summed up in one single command, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, what he's saying is, be to others as Christ has been to you. Now, when it comes to this idea of fulfilling the law of Christ and bearing one another's burdens, there's also a, another angle of this. There's a more broad aspect to this in the sense of any burdens that somebody's bearing, that a brother and sister is bearing. So when Paul talks about bearing burdens, he's talking about the emotional burdens, the spiritual burdens, the sin burdens, but he's also talking about the physical burdens that we're called um, to, to walk with other people and to carry with alongside of those things. And this is where it gets a little hard because we don't like this. Because if we're going to carry the burdens of somebody else, it means it's going to cost us something. And we don't like that. Which means our only motivation is what? To look at Jesus and see what it cost him to, to carry your burdens. This is why, again, fixing our eyes on Jesus is the means and motivation. You're not going to be motivated to carry somebody else's burdens if you don't see the burdens that Christ has carried for you. And so when he sits here and talks about this, he's saying, listen. Listen, look at Jesus, keep your eyes fixed on him and understand what he's done for you and let that flow through you. So let me ask you this, as we evaluate how we're responding to the love of Christ, of all the burdens that you're carrying right now, how many of those are the burdens of other people? Of all the burdens you're carrying, how many of those burdens are of other people? Because Paul's call is clear that as Christ has been to us, we're to be to others. Christ he, he took on all of our burdens. He took on all of our sin and shame. He took it all on and gave it all up. Our response is that we walk in a life where we are willing to carry the burdens of other people. Now, this doesn't mean you're responsible to carry everybody's burdens or all burdens, but it doesn't mean that you can't carry any burdens. And that's what we do is like sometimes we either, we either overindulge or we abdicate. It's like I'll carry everybody's burdens and we have a savior complex. Or on the other side, we're like, man, I just I don't want to, you know, I can't carry burdens. And you find yourself like, bro, you're not carrying any burdens. You're not walking through anything with anybody. You're not in the trenches doing anything for anybody. You're not serving. You're not caring. You're not loving in the same way that Christ has loved you. For some of you, there's a flip side to this. You've got to ask yourself the question, are you actually allowing other people the privilege of carrying your burden? This is my problem. I don't like to bring people into my burdens because I'm like, man, I'm going I'm to cause them trouble or problems or it's going to be hard on them. And, and that's a mark of conceit, really. Are you willing to open your life up to allow others to help carry your burdens? Real quick, what do these burdens look like? How do we carry these things? Kind of how do we sum this up, what he's talking about? Well, it could be helping somebody financially. It, emotionally, it could be just being present, walking through a difficult season with somebody. Spiritually, it could be walking through a sin struggle with somebody, like we talked about earlier, or walking through the consequences of sin with someone. Physically, it could be helping somebody around the house, helping them in their yard, helping them moving, helping them with their house. It could be helping with other people's kids when they're going crazy or it's getting hard. Or you just say, let me give you all a date night. It, it could be getting a meal to somebody. It could be praying for somebody. There's so many ways that we can carry the burdens of other people, but we've got to be aware and we've got to be intentional. 
We've got to be aware and we've got to be intentional because I can promise you Jesus was aware and he was the utmost of intentional. Here's the goal. We want to bear others' burdens and by doing this, following the footsteps of Christ who bore ours. That's the summary of what Paul's talking about. And again, it comes back to the importance of biblical community. It's going to be really hard to do this and put this into practice if you're not committed to biblical community. If you're not life-on-life relationships or you're not coming on Sundays, you're not connected to the local church, you're you're not going to be able to put this into practice. And, And really, not only are you not going to put this into practice, but people aren't going to be able to put this into practice for you. And so often what happens is people come into the church and they're like, man, I just didn't feel loved, served, or cared for. And obviously there can be underlying reasons for that and things that need to be addressed. But a lot of times it's because people lack presence and they're not around. We've got to be present and around for these things to be practiced to us. Paul keeps going in verse 3. He says, for if anyone considers himself to be something when he's not, he deceives himself. In other words, he's saying we can never assume because we help restore somebody or we help bear somebody's burdens, that we've got it all together. He's coming back to this. He's keeping you humble. He's keeping us humble. He's like, look, fix your eyes on Jesus. If you respond to the gospel and you, you carry somebody's burden or, or, or you help confront somebody in sin, you ain't got it together. The very thing that you confronted somebody on, the very thing that you did is only in response to the greatest thing that's been done for you. You never get past the gospel. Paul wants us to understand there ain't no bragging rights in the kingdom of God. And he's going to get to this a bit later. There's only one person to boast in. Verse 4, let each person examine his own work, and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with, some, not compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. What's Paul talking about here? Paul's saying that we have to examine our hearts and our genuineness in which we do things and how we carry ourselves and how we're meeting burdens and how we're confronting sin. We've got to examine our own hearts in everything that we do. And this boasting that he's talking about, because I know we look at this and we're like, well, I thought we weren't supposed to boast. What is he talking about? Well, the beauty of when you kind of dive into this and you look at the original language is it's in the future tense. And I love this, which means that the boasting that he's talking about doesn't happen right now. The boasting that he's talking about is not right now in this life. The boasting that he's talking about is the boasting that you'll do when you stand before God one day. And it's not boasting in your works, but it's boasting in the work of Christ in your place. Because when you get there, The last thing you're doing when you stand before Jesus and say, hey, look what I did. (laughs) Look at all the things I brought to the table. You're going to fall and say, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Romans 15, 17, that there is a reason to boast, Paul says, and it's Christ Jesus. It's Christ Jesus. He's the one that we boast in. And then in verse 5, he's making a point. He's not contradicting what he said in verse 2 about bearing one another's burdens. He doesn't use the word burden. He uses the word load very intentionally. And again, it's in the future tense. And so his point is, is that he's saying at the end of the day, God doesn't judge you in comparison to other people. You're going to stand alone before God and be judged accordingly. And you'll either be judged by viewed through the, the blood of Jesus, or you'll be judged according to your own efforts and your own work. Each one of us will individually stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and we will either boast in our work and what we've compared to other people, or we'll boast in the finished work of Jesus. This is a reality for all of us, and Paul's pointing to that reality. And he's going to continue to talk about boasting a little bit later. He says this in verse 6, let the one who has taught the word share all good things with his teacher. What's Paul talking about? And I told y'all, he kind of goes through on the back end what seems like a laundry list, but all of this is biblical responses, Christ-like responses to understanding what Jesus has done for us. And so what is he talking about here when he talks about sharing in all good things with the teacher? Well, the first thing that's implied here is is the teaching of the word. The teaching of the word, which is, by the way, an essential element of the church, which leads to Paul's main point here specifically that you should participate in the financial generosity toward the church that preaches the word. Is this what he's saying? He says, listen, you spend your things on the, you spend your money on the things that are most important. And if you think sound teaching is important, then you should support it financially. This is what it means to love. This is what it means to respond to the word of God. But I also think there's a broader application here. Paul, Paul uses the phrase, share all good things. What he's not saying is that you just come here on the weekend and you pay for a service and you leave, 
right? It's not like going to a restaurant and you pay for the food and tip the waiter, right? You're not just coming in here and kind of paying for your service and tipping me for preaching the word, right? Like that's, that's not what he's, what he's getting at. It's not that you're giving to the pastors and the staff who are the professionals so that they can do the work of the ministry. That's not his point. What I think he's pointing to is not just that you give financially, you should, but that you should partner in the ministry of the church along with those that are part of the church. See, the way that you share all good things is by partnering with the mission and ministry of the church. Think about it, all good things. That's financially and that's also physically, which means this, we've got to understand that the church is not just an organization that you fund, it's a mission that you're a part of. It's a mission that you're part of. It's not just an organization that you fund. It's a mission that you participate in. And when you share in the mission of the church, it happens both financially and physically. So practically, let me ask you this question. Are you a part of a ministry at this local church? Are you a part of serving together, contributing together? Are you sharing the good things that God's given you through your, your gifts and your abilities to leverage them through the vehicle of the local church? Again, when you've experienced the love of Christ tr to you, it, it flows through you. And he's showing us the way that it flows through us within the context of the local church is taking all the good things that God's given you, James 1, every good and perfect gift comes from above, and you taking those gifts and then leveraging them in and through the vehicle of the local church. And when you do that, when you do that, watch this, you're bearing each other's burdens. You're bearing each other's burdens. You're bearing the burden of ministry together. You're bearing the, you're bearing the financial burden of executing things together, which ties into Paul's main emphasis, right? And again, all this, all this is rooted in love. And then Paul says this in verse 7, don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Now, I know that it's easy to read this and think, well, wait a minute, Paul, are you contradicting yourself? The very message you've been teaching to, to the Galatians is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That faith alone by grace alone and Christ alone is the only thing necessary for salvation. And all of a sudden you look at this and you're like, hold up, this sounds a whole lot like karma, right? Karma is the belief that the, the sum of your actions equals your fate in your future. And you're like, Paul, is this kind of what you're getting at? No, the gospel is the exact opposite of that. The gospel is your future existence through Christ determines the sum of your actions. Your future existence in Christ determines the sum of your actions. And Paul's saying, don't be deceived. Don't make a mistake. God, God will not be mocked. Mocked means to turn your nose up to God, to disregard him as if he's beneath your consideration, specifically disregarding God as it relates to how you live. He's saying, don't disregard God. Don't do that. Don't turn your nose up to God. He's saying, listen, understand the love that you've experienced and allow that love to flow through you. Paul's not introducing a new idea here, right? He's, he's holding up an existing principle that he's talked about in so many other places. He's emphasizing the implications of the gospel. And then he fleshes this out in verse 8. He's going to kind of unpack this a little bit further, this whole idea of, of what a person sows and reaps. And he says this in verse 8, because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. In other words, if you sow in the flesh, if you do what you want to do, if you indulge in this life, if you walk in the ways that are pleasing to you and satisfying to your sinful desires, then you will reap destruction because Jesus is not at the center of your life. You are. A lifestyle where you're living in sin and you're taking pleasure in the very thing Jesus died to free you from shows that the spirit is not the center of your life, that your life has not been transformed. There is no fruit that's produced in you. And then Paul kind of contrasts that by, by talking about um, moving from sowing in your flesh to sowing in the, in the spirit, which he talked about earlier. This is the idea of walking in the spirit, keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus. And Paul's saying, look, you do what you want to do, and you're going to reap destruction, but you be who God's called you to be and saved you to be, then you can rest assured that you will be with him forever, that you'll reap eternal life forever. Now, here's the thing that's interesting about this sowing and reaping principle here that Paul brings up. It's also known as something called the law of the harvest. The law of the harvest, I'll summarize it like this for you. If you work out, you will get fit. Right? If you invest money, then you will get a return. The, the idea of the law of the harvest is you seed something in and there's something that comes from it as a result. And so Paul's taking this principle 
And he's actually specifically applying it here as he fleshes out what it looks like to generosity. And I know for some of you, you're like, I didn't really see that coming. Like, what, how, how do you know that? What, is, what do you mean? Well, look at the context. What did he just talk about a little earlier? He talked about sharing in the mission financially as you give and physically as you join in. And, and then in just a little bit in verse 10, Paul's going to talk about generosity again. Now, this principle can be, can be taken a lot broader than this as well. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But it's important to see what Paul's talking about here. Paul's showing us that new life in Christ means that we have a new perspective on our stuff. That we're not owners, we're stewards. And so when he's talking about this law of the harvest, this idea of reaping and sowing and, and sowing into the flesh and sowing into the spirit, he's like, you leverage your stuff for your flesh, destruction. You leverage your stuff for God's kingdom, reminder of where you'll be forever and always because of who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Um, and so it's our perspective that needs to change. And this is what he's getting at. Think about it like this. Um, my daughter, she's seven. And, you know, one of the things that she's got, like a little piggy bank, and she's got her stuff, and she'll be like, you know, Daddy, I want, you know, I want to go buy a, a new shirt. I want to buy a unicorn shirt from Target. You know, those are one of the things she loves, okay? So she's like, I want to buy a unicorn. She's like, no, nah, I'm not going to buy a unicorn shirt from Target. She's like, why not? I'm like, because Daddy said no. You know what I mean? Like, and she's like, well, fine. Then I'll take my money, and I'll go buy it. And I'm like, hold up, girl. That is not your money. That is Mommy and Daddy's money that we have put in your piggy bank, okay? So that's no to that, too, because that's still my money. She's like, what do you mean? And it's like, that's not yours. It's mine. You're just stewarding the stuff that's my stuff that you're holding on to. And it's like, well, fine. Then I'm going to go to my room, and I'm going to get some of my stuff, and I'm going to sell it. And I'm like, hold up. The stuff in your room that you want to get and sell is actually mine and Mommy's stuff that we've put in your room, okay? And it will stay in your room until you're 18, and then you will move out, and you will not return, okay? Amen? This is how it works. But, but it's helping frame out. It's this mentality of like, man, my stuff, my stuff. And y'all, listen, we do the same thing. This is my stuff. I'm going to do what I want. And Paul's like, no, nah, it's not your stuff. You're a steward of God's stuff that he's given you. James 1, we talked about it earlier. Every good and perfect gift is from above. And when you understand the love of Christ to you, it changes how it flows through you. So you love with your finances. You give with your finances. We steward our money with a gospel perspective. Let me ask you this. Is how you spend your money influenced most by the gospel or by selfish gain and satisfaction in your comfort? What is how you spend your money show about your heart? Are you sowing in the flesh or are you sowing in the spirit? See, when we understand that our money follows a heart, it changes the way we view our money and what we spend it on. Generosity, when it comes to that idea of generosity, it's not something that you do for salvation, though. And we've got to understand this. Generosity is how we respond to salvation. This is Paul's point. Remember, everything he's talking about is our gospel response. And so this idea of generosity is not just a thing you put on the list and go, well, I've got to do this to be a Christian, and this is what it... No, no, no. He's saying, look, when you understand how generous God's been with his love toward you, then that generosity will flow through you. This is his point, which leads us into verse 9. In light of the reality of the sowing and reaping principle, he says this, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have the opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially those who belong to the household of faith. So again... Paul's just continuing his challenge in the area of generosity in a broader sense. Here's what you have to see. In order to do good, and this is where he's bringing his argument together, in order, in order to do good, it means that you have to be generous with your time, your talent, and your treasure. It means you take the good talent you've been given, the good money that you've been given, and the good time that you've been given, and you leverage those things for the good of all people. It is impossible to do good, good toward other people if we're not willing to be generous. He's talking about a generosity principle here. And there's something that Paul does, is there's two categories of people that are very important for us to see, to understand kind of even how the church works. He refers to two different groups of people. He says all people, but there's another category in here, especially those in the household of faith. And we talk about this a lot, but we can't take care of the people out there if we can't take care of the people out here. It's the taking care of people in here that gives way to taking care of the people out there. And we certainly want, don't want to go out there and start trying to take care of people, and then they come in here and they go, bro, y'all don't even take care of your own. That's like me going and trying to take care of everybody else's kids and leaving mine hungry and on the side of the road. You don't do that. 
And he's saying, look, especially as the household of faith, why? Because you are designed to be the hands and feet of Jesus to the watching world around you. And so when they come in, they should experience that reality. Doing good for those in the community is very important. It doesn't negate that. We should do that. Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine among men so they may glorify your Father in heaven. We want the community to see Jesus. We want to be part of local ministries and opportunities for the community to see Jesus. And so we've got to be intentional for that. But we can't be intentional for that at the negate of what's happening within our spiritual family. We've got to sow into one another here. We've got to sow into one another deeply here. And then we've got to sow into those that are out there. And one of the ways that we've got to begin to get our head around this is understanding that becoming a Christian, it's not just affiliating with the religion, but it's becoming part of a family. And, and this is where the, the family mentality is so lost in our culture and context today. But the church is a family. It's not like a family. It is a family. So we're called to care for one another like a family and then allow that care for one another to mobilize us to be able to go out there. If our needs are met in here, guess what? We're going to do a great job meeting needs out there. Paul's saying, be intentional in and out. And when it's hard, because it will be, your motivation is Jesus. Because this is what he did for you. Is he did the greatest good for you in your place. Again, Paul's showing us what love in action looks like. When we understand the love of Christ to us, it begins to flow through us to our church and to our community. He says this in verse 11. Look at what, what large letters I use as I write you in my own handwriting. I think Paul goes all caps here. I'm just guessing. Verse 12. Those who want to make a good impression in the flesh are the ones who would compel you to be circumcised, but only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even, for even the circumcised don't keep the law themselves, and they want you to be circumcised in order to boast about in your flesh. What's he talking about? Bottom line, he's coming in here and he's holding up the Judaizers again. This is where his letter's been aimed in a lot of ways. He's saying they're coming in, saying that you've got to do works of the law, i.e. circumcision, and you've got to do that plus Jesus in order to be saved. And the reason why they want to do this is because they want to be able to boast, check this out, I've been circumcised. Don't know how they do that, okay? But I guess they did. They wanted to boast in their flesh, literally their flesh, that they had done a specific act in order to supposedly glorify God and, and keep the law. But Paul's like, bro, listen, they don't even keep the law. They do a thing, but they don't do all the things. And they want you to do this one thing so that you can boast in your own works. It's all about your own works. He goes back to the beginning of what did he talk about? Being conceited. Thinking of ourselves more highly. They wanted to be able to think of themselves highly, and Paul's saying, don't fall to that trap. Don't think that you can do anything. Don't think that you can boast in anything. This is not about your works. It's about the works of Christ. He talks about how they don't want to be persecuted by the offensive nature of the cross. What does he mean by that? Well, listen, we have the same culture and context, really, in a lot of ways today, minus the circumcision piece. But what people love is they love to boast in their own works. Here's what we don't want to hear. Hey, you're not capable of your salvation. Jesus is the only one sufficient and significant enough to save you. You are wretched and sinful, and there's nothing you could ever do to get to God. Nobody wants to hear that. That's offensive, and we say that here. The only thing that should be offensive is the gospel. Paul recognizes the gospel is offensive because it says that you're not capable. And Paul's saying, but that's the beauty, because in your incapability, God's the one that's capable. And so fix your eyes on him. Don't worry about these other people. Don't compare yourself to other people. Don't try to work your way into the kingdom. Just respond to the welcoming that God's given you into the kingdom because of the finished work of Jesus. In essence, you've got this group of people that are trying to access God with all the wrong keys. Think about it like this. Um, my wife, she's hit two examples today, and my daughter has pink eyes, so she's not even here, so it's even better, all right? But, but she goes to get in the house, and her key ring has like 97 keys on it, okay? I've since made an adjustment, but it had 97 keys from every house that she was connected to in her life. Grandparents, aunts, uncles, my house, her house, like the whole thing, right? And so she'd go to get in the door and she'd try to put the key in it. It'd take her five minutes to try every single key until she finally found the right key to give her access into our home. Here's what happens so often, is we're fumbling through the keys of our own works trying to get access to something that those keys will never give us access to. Versus leaning into the access that Jesus has given us. He says, access granted. Access granted. Lean in to him. Paul is pointing us to lean in 
to him. And this is where he begins to land the plane in verse 14. He says, but as for me, Paul's talking, I will never boast. I will never boast. Remember, the false teachers were boasting in their circumcision and their ability. And Paul's saying, I I will never boast. As for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. In other words, he's saying, you were subdued to the sin of this world, but in Christ you've been freed and you are now a son or a daughter. And Paul says this in verse 15, for both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. It literally doesn't matter if you do or don't do these things because they amount to nothing. And that's the same with any works that we could try to do. They amount to nothing before Jesus. He says what matters instead is a new creation. Verse 16, may peace come to all those who follow this standard and mercy even to, the, even to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble because I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. He's like, get off of me. I got cuts on my back. Leave me alone. Verse 18, brothers and sisters, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. Amen. Wow, what a letter. I mean, this man, this man gets it, right? He gets it. And he's like, I will boast in one thing, and it is Jesus. I will not boast in my works. I will not boast in my efforts. I will not boast in my ability. I will boast in the finished work of Jesus. He says, realize that there is nothing that you can contribute, that you've been saved through the finished work of Jesus, that when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, Jesus made you alive again. How? When we were dead in our sins, separated from a perfect and holy God, Jesus came and lived in our place. He was our perfection in all the places we failed. And then he goes to the cross as our punishment, dying in our place. And then he would raise from the dead to give us hope of new life, becoming the new creation that Paul's talking about. And when our boast is in Christ alone, we become a new creation that's not based on our works, our performance, our past, or even our future, but it's based on Christ alone. And it never changes and it never shifts. Paul opens our eyes to a new perspective and a new place that we get to be a new creation. And what does this new creation look like? This new creation looks like a group of people that have experienced the love of Christ and that that love of Christ flows through them. This is where Paul is is pointing us. He's saying that when you understand who Jesus is and what he's done for you, when he is your boast, then it changes everything for you everything. And so my question for you this morning, as we come to the end of our series in Galatians, is what are you boasting in? What are you boasting in? Is it your ability? Is it your efforts? Is it how good you look? Is it how spiritual or religious you are? Or are you boasting in the finished work of Jesus? For some of you this morning, you're sitting here and there's so many places that you you look and and what we walk through, this idea of what it looks like to have the love of Christ flow through us. And you're like, man, there's all these gaps in my life. And my question is, where's your boast? Because of course, there's going to be gaps in your life if you're not boasting in Christ. Paul's saying that as we fix our eyes on Jesus and we see his love, then that love flows through us. If your eyes are not fixed on Jesus, you will never see the implications that Paul walked through today. You're not generous with your time. You're not generous with your talent. You're not generous with your treasure. You're not seeing the love that you've been given. You don't carry each other's burdens. You're not seeing the burdens that have been carried for you. You you don't do good to the people around you. Then you've not seen the greatest good that's been done for you. Everything that Paul's talking about rises and falls off of us fixing our eyes on Jesus. And so what that means is we don't leave here with guilt and shame. It means that we leave here beholding Jesus saying, Jesus, I see the gaps in my life, but I see you as greater. I know that you paid for them, and I want you to change my heart. I want you to open my hands. I want you to make me a person that lives out the love that you've shown to me. Would you do that in me? Would you do that through me? And I can promise you, If every one of us fix our eyes on Jesus and we devote and commit together to fix our eyes on Jesus, we rally together and say, Jesus, Jesus is our aim. Then you will watch as the characteristics of Jesus begin to flow through you. Every single one of us has a gospel response this morning. And that's fixing our eyes on Jesus. Ain't a one of us got it together. Ain't a one of us living out perfectly what Paul's talking about. And the answer is not go be better. It's fix your eyes on Jesus. 
for some of you this morning, you need to surrender to Jesus for the very first time, that maybe we've been walking through this series and, and you've realized that for you, Christianity is a religion that you've participated in or affiliated with, but it's not a person that you behold. And this morning, you need to open your hands and say, Jesus, I surrender all. I want to experience your love. I want to experience your affirmation. I want to experience all that you've offered me. And this morning, you need to give your life to Christ. We want to walk with you. There's a card in your seat back. Just fill it out and drop it in the boxes on your way out. We want to be the church. We want to carry that burden with you. For others of you, you've been a Christian. We've been walking through the series, and God just keeps pricking at your heart, pricking at your heart. And you're looking, you're like, man, I'm seeing these places in my life. I'm not really living generous. I'm not, I'm not really generous with my money. I'm not really generous with my time. I'm not really generous with my talent. I'm not, I'm not bearing each other's burdens. I'm not doing good for other people. I, I just kind of come in on the weekend and go through the motions. And this morning, you need to sit open-handed and fix your eyes on Jesus and allow yourself to see how much he loved you that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross for you. That his blood ran down that splintered piece of wood so that you could experience life abundantly with him forever. That you'd see how much he loves you. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Would you see the love of God this morning? And would you take that love of God and apply it to the gaps in your life? And ask God to change your heart. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Just take the next couple of minutes as we reflect and as we sing. And all this is part of orienting our hearts to worship as we sing, pray, sit, come, kneel, respond. Jesus, do work in this place. Would you make us a church that is desperately in love with you, that sees how much you love us? Would you this morning stir the affections of our heart toward you as we bask in the love that you've given us? And would it lead to a gospel-centered, love-driven life to those around us? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.